we're talking about hearing. Uh, so now we're zoomed in. Uh, we've got everything blown up a little bit bigger as we're looking here at the ear. And uh, you can see this is just the very end of the auditory canal. Did not mean to do that. Here is our tympanum. Uh, the ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes, there's our eustachian tube. That's what gets kind of uh, swollen shut um, when kids get ear infections. Here is our cochlea. Remember the structure of the inside of the cochlea. There's one tube that takes the wave of fluid inward, and then there's another tube filled with fluid that takes that wave outward, and then the wave that has been created by the stapes uh, that dies right there at the round window. Now this, the whole vestibule, and these guys, the one, two, three semicircular canals, those are what give us our sense of balance. It's the cochlea that gives us our sense of hearing. <clears throat> the auditory nerve is actually called the vestibulocochlear nerve. I'm sorry that I've got, I've got the common name for it there. But it's called the vestibulocochlear nerve because there is a cochlear nerve and there's a vestibular nerve, and where they come together is called the vestibulocochlear nerve. Great, a little bit of review. So make sure you know the roles of the different parts of the ears. The job of the tympanum is to uh, turn sound waves into a into a okay that won't work into a mechanical wave, and then the ossicles amplify the mechanical motion that oval window, that is the barrier between the middle ear and the inner ear. And that is where um, the fluid wave is going to actually start. The proximal end of the cochlea is where we will experience high pitched sounds. And the distal cochlea is where the mechanoreceptors that resonate to the vibration of lower pitch sounds, that's where we will find that. The semicircular canals there's one that goes, a pair that goes this way, a pair that allows us to know if we're doing a summer uh, cartwheel, a pair that goes this way that lets us know if we're doing a somersault, and a pair that goes this way that lets us know if we're doing a pirouette. And we get input from all three of them to know how we are rotating in space, particularly if you're something like a gymnast or a diver, uh, those kind of things. Uh, the semicircular canals tell us that. Now, it's the utricle and the saccule, which is the vestibule part of the inner ear, that tells you which end is up and whether or not you're accelerating in space. If we look at these mechanoreceptor cells of the cochlea, they look like this. They're called hair cells, and hair cells is the specific type of mechanoreceptor cell that is used to give us our sense of hearing and balance. Um, it, in this particular image, this is a biopsy from someone who had hearing problems. These are healthy hair cells. They're still able to do their job. These hair cells, they have been damaged so badly or damaged so frequently and over such a long period of time that they're no longer able to grow back and they can't really do their job very well. The number one cause of acquired deafness is damage to the delicate hair cells. And the primary way that hair cells get damaged is by being exposed to very loud sounds. So if you walk around my house on any given day, you will hear my husband and I going, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you say that again? What did you say? I'm not sure. I'm sorry, were you talking to me? <laughs> okay. That is, that is our life, and it's because we've just been listening to sounds that are too loud for too long. Um, the reason that we advise our patients to keep the sounds of their electronic musical devices uh, at 50% or lower is because above 50% on, um, on most headphones, uh, you are actually starting to damage your uh, ears, hair cells. If you've ever come back from a concert and as you're lying awake at night, you hear this kind of buzzing in your ears, that is some of these guys dying and cursing you as they die. Um, they will grow back, um, but they don't grow back an infinite number of times. So if you keep going to many loud concerts or 
listening to loud music on a really regular basis, uh, they will die off. By the way, by the time you're 21, you have already lost the ability to hear some sounds. Even if you're just living in LA, um, living in LA uh, on, on, in any city is not a particularly quiet experience. Um, if you're standing ready to walk across the street, so you're waiting for the crosswalk and uh, a fire truck with a siren goes by you or a bus, a diesel bus goes past you. Those are making sounds that are loud enough to damage your hearing. So even by the time you're 20 or 21, you've lost the ability to hear certain sounds. Um, so if you ever have like a niece or a nephew or your own kid who's hearing a high pitched sound and you don't hear it, yet trust them because they do hear things that we can't hear. But when we used to meet in real life, at this point I might actually do one of those hearing tests and uh, at the beginning, we all hear them, but pretty quickly, I don't hear those sounds anymore. And so theoretically, <laughs> I've never done this, but theoretically, I could just crank up the volume on those sounds and you people sitting there would be like, stop. And I'd be like, what? Because I don't hear them anymore. Why? Because the, the cells that used to tell me that that sound was there, those cells have died. Um, and by the way, for everyone in the classroom, there are sounds that I will play at a normal amplitude. We'll talk about amplitude. And very few people in the class can hear them anymore. So it's, if you don't have the mechanoreceptor cells, you can't hear the sound. All righty. Uh, balance, yes, and the eustachian tube, great. Okay. So the vestibular apparatus, hmm, I thought I had... What? Let me talk about the properties of sound before we talk about balance, all right? Sound is a mechanical wave. So it's not an electromagnetic wave, it's a mechanical wave, but it is a wave. And so we can measure the properties of this wave. And waves all have a wave length and a wave amplitude, okay? The wave amplitude is how loud the sound is. The wave length is the pitch of the sound. So let's look over here. Let me get up. Sorry, let me get out the pen, All right? So you can see from here to here is a, a, not as tall as from here to here, okay? So that means this is a louder sound than this is because that is the amplitude. So on the exam, pay attention, okay? The loudness of a sound wave is, is going to be proportional to the amplitude of the wave. Now, these two sounds up here, they are the same frequency. They have got the same frequency or the same wavelength. Okay? Wavelength is another way to describe the frequency of a sound wave because the length, the wavelength just determines how many waves per second, and that's the frequency. So frequency and wavelength, and they determine pitch. Ready? So these guys are the same pitch, like, right? But this one has got a longer wavelength or a longer frequency than this sound. So this would be a very low note, and this would be a very high note. I don't have much of a range, do I? <laughs> All right. But even though this is a low pitch and this is a high pitch, we would say they have the same loudness. Why? Because the amplitude of the wave is the same for the two waves. All right. Okay, so wavelength and pitch. Now, one more thing about wavelength and pitch, and this is going back to a principle that we talked about in an earlier lecture. And that earlier lecture we were talking about that um, all a, a sensory neuron can do is send out a click, right? And a click would look like these guys, like click, 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 
how does your brain know how loud the sound is? Your brain only knows that, that how loud a sound is by how quickly the action potentials are coming from that sensory neuron and also how many of those sensory neurons are sending in action potentials. So if we had a sound that was very quiet, then it might look like this right here. We've got click, 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 not that many clicks. As the amplitude gets bigger, that is our sound getting louder, then we have click, 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 click. And when the sound gets super loud, then that cell is just like click, 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 just clicking as fast as it can, sending action potentials as fast as it can. Now, how does your brain know whether it's a low note or a high note? It knows a low note or a high note based on which, uh, which hair cells are sending action potentials to which parts of the brain. Okay, so those two things. All right, now let's see if maybe we can go backwards. My so I am sorry. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about balance. Now, all of this is the inner ear, all this stuff in blue is the inner ear. We've got the cochlea that looks like a snail shell, <clears throat> and it's in the organs of Corti, the, uh, the cochlear uh, organs, that uh, we have the mechanoreceptor cells that allow you to experience sound. But the rest, the rest of this allows us to experience uh, balance. And it's divided up into static balance, which is I'm holding still and I want to know up from down, and kinetic balance, which is I'm spinning around. Ready? The semicircular canals allow us to know, are we, is the chair spinning around? And if I was in complete darkness and blindfolded and all that stuff, I could still know if I'm spinning. Up until the point <clears throat> that the fluid inside of my semicircular canals catches up with the fluid with, with the hair cells. Well, let's talk about that. Let's look at the vestibular apparatus itself. Now, I envision this area here as being sort of like a uh, snow globe. You know, if you've got a snow globe and if you shake it up, the snow all goes fluffing around, but if you let it sit, it'll settle. Now imagine that everywhere there's glass on the snow globe, instead of glass, we're going to have a bunch of these hair cells, okay? These different kind of hair cells, and they are putting their little ends out into the water of the snow globe. And if snow lands on them, they bend. And when they bend, then it sends out an action potential that goes to your brain and tells you that way is down, right? So you shake up the snow globe, the snow settles here, and that is going to be in my ear, and that will bend over my hair cells, and it'll go this way is down. If I tilt my head, then now the snow went, ooh, and now the snow is resting on the, that part, and now I know that way is down, okay? So the, uh, the, uh, the vestibular apparatus works primarily on the settling of the snow. The semicircular canals, they are measuring the movement of fluid through the canals. Okay, to the hair cells, it feels like the movement of fluid, but the truth is that the fluid does not move right away when you turn your head real quickly. Same difference, think of a snow globe. By the way, um, whenever you're surfing, if you're surfing big waves um, and you get tumbled really bad by a wave, the rule is you should not swim for the surface right away. And the reason is when you get tumbled really bad by a wave and you're underneath in all this churning water, you just have your snow globe shook up. You actually don't know which way is up. So if you swim right away for the surface, there's a chance you're actually just wasting your energy and your air and you could be swimming deeper. So the idea is you need to 
not swim at all for a moment, and then two things will happen. One thing that will happen is your body is a little bit buoyant and it will start to move upward. And the other thing that will happen is the snow will start to settle and then you'll know which way is up and you can move towards the surface at that point. All right, all mechanoreceptors. We will mention proprioceptors at the beginning of the next video.